Hello students, welcome to the presentation, Teaching Grammar. Grammar as we know plays a vital role in one's life for the fluency and the accuracy of the language. Grammatical structures not only have form, they are also used to express meaning in context appropriate use. In order to guide us in a constructing an approach to teaching grammar that strives to meet this definition, it would be helpful to have a frame of reference. The three dimensions which concern grammar teaching are structure or form, semantics or meaning and the pragmatic conditions governing the use. In this series, we are going to critically examine the issues and strategies of teaching grammar in language classrooms in the context of English language teaching. The objectives are to realize the need for a change in the methodology of teaching of grammar in the current teaching learning process. We will discuss the following components of grammar, articles, sentences and types of sentences, subject and predicate, conditional sentences, transformation of sentences and punctuation. We will discuss grammar teaching the issues. We will be dealing with five components of grammar. Number one, teaching articles. There are three articles in total. The words a or an and the are called articles. They come before nouns. Types of articles. There are two types of articles, a or an, which is indefinite article and the, which is definite article. A or an is called the indefinite article because it usually leaves the indefinite person or thing spoken of as a doctor, that is any doctor. The is called the definite article because it normally points out some particular person or thing as he saw the doctor, meaning some particular doctor. Use of articles. The definite article is used before singular countable nouns. For example, a book, an orange, a girl. The definite article is used before singular countable nouns, plural countable nouns and uncountable nouns. For example, the book, the books, the milk. Now, let us look at the differences between the indefinite articles a and an. The choice between a and an is determined by the sound. Before a word beginning with a vowel sound, an is used. For example, an egg, an enemy, an ink pad, an orange, an umbrella, an hour, an honest man, an air. It will be noticed that the words our, honest, air begin with a vowel sound as the initial consonant H is not pronounced. Before a word beginning with a consonant sound, A is used as a boy, a woman, a yard, a horse, a hole, also a university, a union, a European or a unicorn, a useful article, etc. Because these words, university or union, etc., begin with a consonant sound that of u. Similarly, we say a one rupee note, such as a one, a one eyed man, because one begins with the consonant sound w. Now, let us look at the use of the definite article. The definite article the is used when we talk about a particular person or thing or one already referred to. That is, when it is clear from the context which one already referred to, that is, when it is clear from the constant which one we mean, as the book you want is out of print. Which book? The one you want. Now, before some proper nouns, we use these kinds of place names, oceans and seas, example, the Pacific, the Black Sea, and before the rivers, example, the Ganga, the Nile, and before canals, for example, the Suez Canal, before deserts, for example, the Sahara, and before groups of islands, for example, the West Indies, and before mountain ranges, for example, the Himalayas, the Alps, etc., and before a very few names of countries, which include words like republic and kingdom, example, the Irish Republic, the United Kingdom or the Netherlands and its seat of government, the Hague. 
before the names of certain books such as the Vedas, the Puranas, the Iliad, the Ramayana, the Bible, the Quran. We also use the definite article before the names of things unique of their kind as the sun, the sky, the ocean, the sea, the earth before a proper noun when it is qualified by an adjective or defining adjectival clause as the great Caesar, the immortal Shakespeare. The Mr. Roy whom you met last night is my uncle with superlatives as the darkest cloud has a silver lining. This is the best book of elementary chemistry. She is the most beautiful girl. We also use with ordinals as he was the first man to arrive and we also use before musical instruments as he can play with the flute, the guitar, the piano. We also use before an adjective when the noun is understood as the poor are always with us. Now let us look at the use of indefinite article. The indefinite article is used in its original numerical sense of 1 as 12 inches make a foot, not a word was said. A word to the wise is sufficient. Another example, a bird in the hand is worth 2 in the bush. In the vague sense of a certain as a kishokuma. A certain person named Kishokuma is supposed suspected by the police. One evening a beggar came to my door. In the sense of any to single out an individual as a representative of a clause as a pupil should obey his teacher or if we take another example a cow is a useful animal. To make a common noun of a proper noun as a Daniel comes to judgment. A Daniel here means a very wise man. Now let us look at some of the omissions of the article. The article is omitted before the names of substances and abstract nouns. For example, the uncountable nouns used in a general sense as sugar is bad for your teeth, gold is a precious metal, wisdom is the gift of heaven. Now in these examples we can see the omission of article. Before plural countable nouns used in a general sense, we also avoid using articles. For example, children like chocolates, computers are used in many offices. So in these examples, we do not use any article before children or computers. What do you mean by a sentence? A sentence is a group of words which makes complete sense. For example, she likes ice cream. So in this group of sentences, there is a lot of meaning. Now let us look at types of sentences. There are four types of sentences, declarative or assertive sentence, interrogative sentence, imperative sentence and exclamatory sentence. Now let us look at each type of sentence in detail. The first one the declarative or assertive sentence. A sentence that makes a statement or assertion is called a declarative sentence. For example, I want to learn English well or she knows five languages. So it is called a declarative or assertive sentence. The second type of sentence, interrogative sentence. A sentence that asks a question is called interrogative sentence. For example, where do you live? May I borrow your book? Now these are the two types of interrogative sentences. Now the third type of sentence is imperative sentence. A sentence that expresses a command, request, suggestion, warning or an entreaty or a request is called an imperative sentence. For example, be quiet is an example of a command. Please sit down is an example of a request. Watch out for the dog is a warning. Let us go slowly, it is a suggestion. Have mercy on us is a plea. 
So, these are different types of imperative sentences. Now, let us look at the fourth type of sentence, it is exclamatory sentence. A sentence that expresses strong feelings or emotions such as happiness, sadness, surprise and anger. Now, let us look at some of the examples for exclamatory sentence. Wow! The peacock is beautiful. Hooray! We won the match. Alas! He is dead. How cold the night is! Or what a shame! Now, these are different types of exclamatory sentences where we have sudden feeling or emotion. As we looked at the types of sentences, every sentence has two parts. The subject of a sentence is the part which names the person or thing we are speaking about. Example, he reads newspaper every day. In this sentence, there is a subject and a predicate. He is subject and the rest of the sentence is a predicate. The subject of a sentence usually comes first, but occasionally it is also put after the predicate as here comes the bus. So, here the bus comes at the end and it can be the subject of a sentence. The predicate of a sentence is the part which tells something about the subject. In imperative sentences, the subject is left out as sit down. Now, in this example, we do not have the subject. Here, the subject you is understood. Thank him. Here also, the subject you is understood. So, these are the two types of parts of sentences. For example, the subject which comes in the beginning of the sentence and the predicate which comes after the subject. Now, let us look at conditional sentences. In this four conditionals and these conditionals are known as zero conditional, first conditional, second conditional and third conditional. Now, let us look at each one with examples. Zero conditional. Zero conditional is used for present real or factual situations. For example, if I study hard, I always pass my exam. Now, the first part, if I study hard is a present simple and it is if clause, there is a condition. And in the second part of the sentence, I always pass my exam is a main clause which gives the result. And in this example, we have the present simple. Now, let us look at the first conditional. In the first conditional, it is used for future or real or factual situations. If you look at the example, if I study hard, I will pass my exam. If you look at this example, the first part, if I study hard is a present simple. And let us look at the second part of the sentence, I will pass my exam. Here, will plus base form of the verb. For example, will plus pass. So, in the first conditional, when we speak, we should say, if I study hard, I will pass my exam. Unlike zero conditional, where if I study hard, I always pass my exam. So, there is a slight difference between zero conditional and first conditional. And quite often, most students make a mistake in zero conditional. So, when they mean to say uh, a condition like, if I study hard, they tend to say, if I will study hard. So, you can never say, if I will study hard. That would be a common error. Therefore, in zero conditional, you are supposed to say, if I study hard, I will always pass my exam. Likewise, in the first conditional, you should not use will. If I study hard, I will pass my exam. So, the will comes in the main clause and not in the if clause. So, many students use will in the if clause. So, we need to avoid will in the if clause. For example, if I study hard, not if I will study hard. So, we need to remember, if I study hard, I will pass my exam. Now, let us look at the second conditional, which is used for present or future 
unreal imaginary situations. Now, in this conditionals, the example is, if I studied hard, I would pass my exam. And we need to notice here, if I studied hard, in this clause, we have simple past tense. So, studied is a V2 form of the verb. Now, second part of the sentence, the main clause, where I would pass my exam. In the earlier conditional, we have seen, I will pass my exam. Therefore, we need to notice in the if clause, if I studied hard, I would pass my exam. So, this is the right way of usage of second conditional. But many people do not distinguish between the first conditional and the second conditional. The second conditional should be remembered as if I studied simple past tense and would plus base form, I would pass my exam. So, the example goes like this. If I studied hard, I would pass my exam. Now, let us look at third conditional. Third conditional is used for past unreal imaginary situations. Unlike the first conditional, where we have real imaginary situation, in the third conditional, we use for past unreal imaginary situations. Let us look at an example. If I had studied hard, I would have passed my exam. Now, in this example, if you notice, past perfect is used. In the earlier conditional, past simple is used in the if clause. Now, let us look at the if clause in this example. If I had studied hard, had studied is past perfect tense. Now, in the main clause, I would have passed my exam. Now, here if you look at the structure, would have plus past participle. So, the sentence goes like this. If I had studied hard, I would have passed my exam. So, the difference between second conditional and third conditional is in the tense. In the second conditional, we have past simple. In the third conditional, we have past perfect. Now, verbs in time clauses and conditionals follow the same pattern as in other clauses, except in clauses with time words, when after, until we often use the present tense forms to talk about the future. I will come home when I finish work. You must wait here until your father comes. And you cannot say, you must wait here until your father will come. No, that would be grammatically wrong. Therefore, we must say, you must wait here until your father comes. Now, in transformation of sentences, we have three types, simple, compound and complex. Let us examine the following sentences first. Sentence 1, his courage won him honor. Sentence 2, the moon was bright and we could see our way. Night came on and rain fell heavily and we all got very wet. Now, if you notice these three sentences, we see that sentence 1 has only one subject and one predicate, such as a sentence is called a simple sentence. So, a simple sentence is one which has only one subject and one predicate or a simple sentence is one which has only one subject and one predicate. Now, if you look at sentence 2, it consists of two parts. Part 1, the moon was bright and part 2, we could see our way. These two parts are joined by the coordinating conjunction and each part contains a subject and a predicate of its own. Each part is what we call a clause. We further notice that each clause makes a good sense by itself and hence, we could stand by itself as a separate sentence. Each clause is therefore, independent of the other or of the same order or rank and therefore, it is called a principal or main clause. 
a sentence such as the second which is made up of principal or main clause is called a compound sentence. Sentence 3 if you take it consists of three clauses of the same order or rank. In other words sentence 3 consists of the three principal or main clauses. In other words uh, part 1 night came on, part 2 rain fell heavily, part 3 we all got very wet. Such a sentence is also called a compound sentence. A compound sentence is one made up of two or more principal or main clauses. Now, we need to note the term double is now used for a sentence which consists of two principal or main clauses and the term multiple for a sentence of more than two principal or main clauses. Sentence 4 consists of two parts, they rested when evening came. Now, each part contains a subject and a predicate of its own and forms a part of a larger sentence. Each part is therefore, a clause. We further notice that the clause they rested makes a good sense by itself and hence could stand by itself as a complete sentence. It is therefore, called the principal or main clause. The clause whenever evening came cannot stand by itself and makes a good sense. It is dependent on the main clause they rested. It is therefore, called a dependent or subordinate clause. A sentence such as the fourth is called a complex sentence. Sentence 5 consists of three clauses. Now, let us look at each part. In part 1, the people said it is main clause. Part 2, as the boxes advanced into the ring is a subordinate adverb clause. Part 3, they would not allow them to fight. It is subordinate noun clause. Such a sentence is called a complex sentence. A complex sentence consists of one main clause and one or more subordinate clauses. Now, sentence 6 consists of three clauses. Let us look at part 1. In part 1, Anil called at 530, it is the main clause. Part 2, I mid him, that is the main clause. Part 3, that you had gone out is the subordinate noun clause. Such a sentence is called a compound sentence. Now, as we know, punctuation plays a vital role, and if we do not have a punctuation mark in a sentence, it can give entirely a different meaning. Now, these are the following types of punctuation marks. Now, we have punctuations such as full stop, question mark, exclamatory mark, comma, colon, semicolon, apostrophe, inverted commas, iphone or dash and finally, brackets. Now, let us look at each uh, punctuation mark in detail. Now, the rule used for punctuation mark full stop is, now full stop is used at the end of a sentence. For example, the elephant is big followed by a full stop. So, at the end of the sentence, we have a full stop such as the elephant is big. Now, let us look at the second punctuation mark, question mark. Now, it is used at the end of a direct question. Where is the man? Now, in this sentence, the question mark is at the end of the sentence. Now, the third punctuation mark, exclamatory mark, it is used at the end of a sentence, which expresses a sudden surprise, shock, horror, or enthusiasm. Let us look at example. Wow, the rainbow is beautiful. Now, the word wow is followed by an exclamatory mark and the expression and the tone also should vary, since it is a sudden surprise and the exclamatory mark 
should be used after wow. Now let's look at another example. The huge elephant sat on the man. So it is also an exclamatory mark comes at the end of the sentence. Now the next punctuation mark is comma. Comma shows a pause in a sentence. Let's look at an example. Sally likes to eat chocolate, hot dogs and broccoli. Now you have three things in this sentence, chocolate, hot dogs and broccoli. So after chocolate we have a comma, after hot dogs we have a comma. So when there is a comma slightly you have to pause a bit. Now let us look at next punctuation mark colon. It is used to introduce something such as a list. She placed the following items in the trolley, colon, beer, fruit, vegetables, toilet rolls, cereals and cartons of milk. So when you have a list of things to be followed, you should have colon just before this list of things. Now let us go to the next punctuation mark, semicolon. Semicolon is used to separate two contrasting parts of a sentence or items in a list. For example, we set out at dawn, the weather looked promising. Now there are two sentences, we set out at dawn, now after dawn we have semicolon. So that separates a contrasting part. Now let us go to the next punctuation mark, apostrophe. It shows that a letter is missing. Let us take an example, the boys room is painted blue. Now here the boys is an apostrophe which shows the possession. Let us look at another punctuation mark, inverted commas. Inverted commas are used to show the words that somebody said or around a title, a play, film, etc. Let us take an example, punctuation is important. My teacher said, quotation marks begin, without punctuation marks your writing would be very confusing, quotation marks closed. Now whatever is used in direct speech, we use punctuation mark or we use quotation marks. Let us look at another punctuation mark, iPhone. Iphan is used to join two words or two separate phrase forms from the rest of a sentence. Let us look at an example, 18th century people. Now in this example, 18th century has an iPhan or a dash or another example, non-verbal. So non iphan verbal. Now let us look at the last punctuation mark brackets. Brackets are used to keep extra information. The strategy or strategies chosen to meet the objectives may need to change as the introversion continues. Now here in this sentence, strategies is used in bracket. So when less importance is given, we use it in bracket. This is the end of the presentation. Thank you.